The chat cast between Dangerous Minds and Caitlin Marie. A sneak peek. I'm doing pretty well. Having a pretty good day so far. Um, you were finally able to get me to actually sit down and call you, which is an amazing achievement. So you should give yourself a pat on the back for that. <laughs> I will because it it has taken a while. It has. But I am, as I said, I am so excited to have you here. I'm able to provide some kind of helpful insight to you, and hopefully, other people will find it helpful as well. That's my hope, at least. Um, so I think we will start out by um, trying to introduce me a little bit so that people understand why my insight might matter at all. So what I was wondering was yeah. how did you first find or become aware that you were different? And forgive me if that's not uh, the right no, way no, to no, say that's, that's good. That's a perfect way to put it, actually. Um, uh, I think, like, childhood stuff it's, you know, you're a child, just like every child is figuring things out. Um, mm -hmm. When I got to be a teenager, I think, well, I think when I was a child, I knew that I was, I was different than other people. Um, I wasn't, I think I've said this to you before, you know, I think people, everyone I think can remember like the, like psycho kid from when they were in school. And I wasn't that kid that was like acting out in class. Um, it was more, I was much quieter and in the background kind of observing things, but I knew that, you know, I saw things that other people didn't see, or I was paying attention to things that other people weren't paying attention to. Let me try to think of a good example. Um, you know, like even if you, if you walk into a room in school um, you know, there are people that, you know, first day of school that are, you know, excited and looking around at all of their classmates and they're excited for the school year. They're nervous, you know, to see everyone or, you know, there's a boy they like this and that, um, you know, they see these, you know, positive things that they're looking forward to for the school year, where for me, it's, it's more about, okay, like I have all of the things that I need for school, book, book bag, you know, pencils, pens, papers, um, and then school itself, you know, it's, it's more of like a playground for someone like me, um, where it's just a really amazing place for people watching and learning, you know, what makes people tick. And so I, I don't remember a lot of history class necessarily, um, but I learned a lot in school because it gave me this amazing access to people, developing people, and that especially gives you um, a real bird's eye view into exactly how humans work and how their emotions work and how you can manipulate them then looking at the manipulation factor that early. Yeah. When did you realise that you needed to do that? I think just here, just having you ask the question, I vividly remember um, like being in, in class in the first grade and figuring, and I watched my classmates for like a day and then the next day, I knew exactly how to make friends. And I went into class the next day and I made friends with all of the people that I wanted to make friends with because I spent the first day watching 
how and learning how. And so even in first grade, I don't think I was aware, aware, but I know, you know, I was aware that I wasn't doing what the other children were, if that, if that makes sense, the way that I explained it. That's really interesting. So you knew on some level, but you didn't know. Um, I didn't know how to have a full it. level of awareness. Right. Of I knew I knew I was different, but I didn't know why, and I didn't know how to use it to my advantage, really. So, you know, what school really gave to me was a a place to experiment a little bit and to figure out not just how other people worked, but also how I worked and how I could use the traits that I had that other people didn't seem to have to my advantage. So you're, what you're saying is, from your perspective, it, for your personal experience, mm-hmm. your, your development of sociopathy was nature rather than nurture. Correct. And then... It leads actually right into it. So then when I was a little bit older, I'll just skip ahead a little bit. Um, so when I was around, you know, 16, 17 and really started dating and really, really learned what I was capable of, um, you know, I, I had a relationship with someone that, you know, at the time I, I believed that I loved them. Now I know that I, I did not, um, you know, because, you know, when I was, you know, I really didn't understand at that age. And I don't think a lot of people that are teenagers from the ages of 16 to 18 really understand what love is. But, you know, I didn't understand that I, that I couldn't do it. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, you know, I had a relationship and for the very first time in my life, you know, and this was a very serious relationship, um, you know, we, we had plans to, you know, be together and to be married and have children, you know, we, it was a very serious relationship. Um, and after, after a few years for a variety of reasons that I won't get into cause it's not pertinent, um, you know, he broke up with me. And this was the very first time in my entire life that someone had rejected me and I couldn't, I I couldn't fix it. And I had been rejected and there was nothing in my arsenal that I could deploy to salvage what I had lost. And I hadn't just lost a boyfriend, I had lost a life that I thought I was going to have. And so it's what's considered a narcissistic injury. And that is the turning point in things for me. Because that's when I I was kind of flailing a bit um, and trying to, like, the best way to put it is that, you know, a narcissistic injury, it's, it's like the first time that a narcissist is confronted with the the reality that they might not be all that they think they are. They might not be quite as fucking wonderful as <laughs> they think they are. You know, rejected for the first time in your life. Imagine that. You've never been rejected before. And someone decides to leave you. And it was, like, devastating for me. As a result of it, um, I ended up in... Um, in a treatment center for substance abuse because I really can I just can I just stop you there and just (laughs) go back just a second um you say that prior to this relationship Mm -hmm. and we must get back to that so do do remember that spot um you had an arsenal already you had an arsenal Mm -hmm. developed you skipped to now somewhere where you got hurt can we go back to you developing that arsenal how how did you develop that arsenal what was the arsenal you developed and how did you use it well um it's really it's really you know it's really just how does anyone learn from life experiences right 
So for me, it's taking all of, you know, the day-to-day interactions, you know, with people, um, whether it's, you know, friends, enemies, teachers, parents, um, co-workers, bosses, when you start working, you know, you you add up all of those day-to-day interactions, all of the life experiences you have, just like anyone does. Um, they just add up to something different for me than they would for someone else. Like I said, there's, I, you know, we can look at the same picture and see different things in it, the same room of people and see different things in it. Um, so these life experiences, for someone else, they could have ended up a completely different person than I am. Um, for me, I ended up the person that I am, and I developed, you know, an arsenal of tools, you know, like how to effectively manipulate people, how to craft lies, small ones or, or large ones, you know, or how to how can to craft, you remember how to craft a long lie. Like that you're Can you remember the development time. of that? Um, no, because I wasn't really conscious of it when it was like when I was kind of accumulating all of these things, it was like kind of filing them all away. You know, you take notice of things and you just you file it for later and um, eventually, you know, kind of. Can you remember the first time you deliberately manipulated somebody when you had learnt, seen how to do it, watched how to do it, learned how to do it? I'm not quite sure how that came about, but can you you remember realising you could do it and the Mm -hmm. first, your first memory of actually doing it, could you share that? Um. Well, I hold on one second. Um, I'm not sure if this is like the very first time, but I remember one of um, one of the the instances that was that was a formative moment in the development of you know my observation and and using my observation to manipulate. So I was on the playground. It was I think fourth grade. Um, so how old, uh, I don't know the age. It doesn't matter. Um, I was young. Maybe about so, nine. Yeah, that would be good. That would be about right. So, um, I was on the playground and do you know the game Red Rover? Where you go Red Rover, Red Rover, yes. send yes. Fiona over. So we were playing Red Rover and this other girl, um, she had on a gold, cross that her parents had given her for her for her um first communion in for church so she had on this gold cross and she was very proud of it and she was so obnoxious um anyway so she ran over she was you know red rover she ran over in between me and another girl and she fell to the ground it was in a sand pit um she fell to the ground for some reason because she was stupid, I don't know, but she fell to the <laughs> ground, and when she got up, her gold cross was gone. Oh my God! Sorry, I can't oh, make dear. fun of people sometimes. I honestly can't help it. So anyway, she gets up and she starts like bawling her eyes out because oh my God, my cross is gone, and my parents are gonna kill me. Oh. And I'm like, okay, like look around, like why don't you try to find it before you like lose your shit, you know? (laughs) And so she was, you know, so I don't know, for whatever reason, she all, all of a sudden decided that somehow I had ripped the cross off of her neck. Like it wasn't even something that was even physically, like it couldn't have even physically. Did you feel at that time that people did look at you differently? Is that why she accused you or did she just accuse you just randomly? She didn't like me at all. She didn't like me, and I didn't like her. So I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think. I think she. She when she realized her cross was missing, 
here's what happened. When she realized her cross was missing and she saw that I was in the vicinity, she realized what she could do to avoid her parents yelling at her for losing her necklace. So she decided... Oh, so it was a, a bit of a double-edged sword on right, both sides. She, she tried to deploy a tactic and she deployed it poorly. And I, you know... I didn't know that I was prepared for this to happen. So, so that's the point. I wasn't, I wasn't aware that I was ready for this when it did happen. But as soon as it started developing, I knew exactly what was happening and I knew exactly how to handle it. So she starts crying and accusing me of ripping this cross off of her neck, which didn't happen by the way. In hindsight, I wish that I had, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I kind of wish that I had taken it. Well, um, to be honest, it, when you were telling the story, it crossed my mind that somehow you had managed to get it off her before I wish she that realized. I, did. Because I wish that I did, because it would have made it, like, better in my mind. Do you know what I mean? Cause mm -hmm. then, cause because then at least you end, would have been accused for a reason. I would have been accused for a reason, and then I really would have fucked with her. Because then when she accused me, of course, I was like, you're being ridiculous. I don't have your necklace. And the, the scenario that you're proposing doesn't even make sense. Like, and there's 20 witnesses here that can clearly vouch for the fact that I didn't rip your necklace off of you. And I also didn't pick it up because in case you didn't notice, I wasn't helping you look for it because I don't care. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. but now I care because you've dragged me into it and now you're going to pay for that. So she was part of the popular clique in mm -hmm. school. And so as soon as I realized what was happening, I turned the tables on her and people came to my defense very quickly. And they defended me and they protected me and they told Andrea that she and was And do you wrong. remember how you turned those tables so quickly? I just played the victim. I was, in, and I was innocent, so it was easy, you know? It wasn't a lie, but I wasn't a victim. <laughs> but it was like, you know, oh, she thought she could do this to me. So now she's going to pay for that. And she was very quickly um, and very publicly, humiliatingly kicked out of the popular group. And so, I, but was you remember I was given what? a promotion. So, so how did you bring that about? Because obviously you brought it about deliberately. So how did, mm -hmm. how did it click in your mind how to do it and what did you do? See, you, I, I'm well, trying to understand. Was, I, the, the thing with that one was that I learned that I didn't really have to do much of anything, really. She destroyed herself by going over the top and accusing me. She also made the mistake of saying to me that, she was accusing me because of course I had stolen it because I lived on the wrong side of the tracks, which by the way was incorrect. <laughs> she, she thought that she could like insult me and say okay. that my family was poor, which was incorrect anyway. So she made a fool of herself in like making these outrageous accusations against me. Does that make sense? Yeah. I and understand I it from your point of her, view. I let her take herself down. How did you get the other people to see it your way? That's that's what I'm I'm trying to get at. How did you how did you switch everybody else away from her? Because normally if somebody's crying and they've lost their right. necklace and in that situation people will feel sorry for that person. Obviously you somehow switched that and you knew you switched that. Do you remember how you affected the other people and manipulated them into seeing into you as a victim even side. though you felt you weren't? Hmm. 
I'm just thinking. Um, I mean, I like I said, I I really because I was still um, I was still learning about how all of this works. Did you turn on fake tears? Yes, yes, I did, but not too much. Just enough that I. I turned it on and I also waited until she worked herself up into being like a screaming banshee. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I waited for her to like be in my face, like screaming and pointing and being a lunatic. So you waited for her to overreact. So then people turned against her and towards. And then they saw me overcome by these accusations and I can't mm-hmm. believe she's accusing me of this and I would never do anything like that and I don't know I don't know what she's talking about and then yes. people come to comfort me because I am clearly very upset that she's accusing me of this and she's being crazy and someone needs to help me and they did yes. and they all and it also showed them oh she's crazy and Caitlin is good yeah. And yes, I and so I, I see how that I would play the part well. But you also have to um, I also learned, you know, that was an, a, a, an incident that I learned how you have to adapt as things are happening, that you might go into something with a plan, but you might have to change it. So you have to have a few options ready to go before you even um, engage. So right. it was it was an eye opening moment for me. It worked out very well for me, and I studied it and I learned from it. And so I, there were even long term benefits. You were saying before right. I um, clarified that her social you were saying life that never you became the in person. Yeah, her her social life never recovered. High school was very lonely for her, and this happened in the fourth grade. So <laughs> I kept it going. So you did that good of a job when you were very nice years old her. on this person yeah. who falsely was, accused you that it affected their whole school life. Right. And I was very nice to them personally. I got other people to be mean to her under the guise of, I don't want to make a scene, you guys. It's not a big deal. You guys, please just leave it alone. Don't say anything to her, please. But they would always say something to her because they wanted to defend me and protect me. And you were doing that on purpose, knowing that that would be the effect of saying yeah. to them, don't do that, don't do it. Yeah, don't do that, please. Oh, I don't want to make a scene. Yeah, yeah. so there's uh, already you're developing this ability for this subliminal um, code almost that they don't even know that you're giving, exactly. but you know you're giving. Exactly. And so those, and so those are the incidents. They're not all as easy to like point out and explain because they're small things or they're large things that happen. Um, but those are like the life experiences that. And also they me. were nature, so we right. we don't remember things that happen or habitually for us the same as you wouldn't right. remember all exactly. of them. It's and that's what I mean. Just like for anyone, their life experience, you know, helps to mold the way that they view the world, their fundamental worldview. My experiences just added up to something different. I I'm using different math. <laughs> yes, I understand. So so then by the time that you got to this relationship, um, yeah. when you're talking about this is the first time that you had this experience of rejection, mm-hmm. you had been able to manipulate people like, like what you have just explained throughout your whole life until this happened and Correct. you weren't able to manipulate this. And so as you, as you were saying, you then um, had to... You ended up in a in a substance abuce. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> ca- carry on from there, where I interrupted yes. you, and, and just backtrack just that little bit, if you if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. So, 
so you know i had this rejection that was this narcissistic injury in my story um and like I said, it's a pivotal moment and I, you know, flailing and trying to figure out and, you know, I, I enjoyed using drugs and alcohol when I was younger. Um, I just want to interrupt here. <laughs> I am just, I am just having AV moments all over the place right now, but continue what you're doing. Okay. So. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those things. It's like, I, I don't like to say like, I, you know, I used drugs and alcohol heavily. So I try to downplay it, but I use drugs and alcohol heavily. Um, there's more to it that I would like to explain at another time, but basically, you know, this, this rejection occurred and I didn't know how to handle it and cope with it. And I, started drinking a lot and using drugs more um i was only like smoking pot and taking i was prescribed xanax and clonopin and i just took a lot of them you know when i they, it, i was supposed to take them as needed and that's what i did i just needed a lot um i have a high tolerance so anyway so that happened do you think blah, do you blah. think it was because you had got gotten your own way that it accentuated the rejection? Yes, and that's what Is, I mean. It's because I had never experienced it. It was you much just worse. absolutely didn't know how to handle it. Right. No coping skills, none. And so, mm -hmm. like, I'll explain just a little. I learned in high school, along with learning a lot about people, I also learned how to use things like drugs and alcohol to. Mm, like amp up the game, I guess, you know, whether it's having other people use substances or using them to regulate myself so that like I behave like other people do at a party, you know, so I fit in better or whatever, um, whatever I need to do to help myself to cope with any given situation. And so when it when this rejection happened, I was I, I did try to use, you know, substances to regulate myself because I was. Had you used them so prior to this? Yes. You know, just like a teenager does. Um, I mean, I did get expelled from high school, but that's besides the point. <laughs> uh, the point Some might is. Uh-huh. What? Some might disagree that it's beside the point. I know, and that's why I hesitate to even um, to even mention it because I feel that that some people won't be able to understand it. Because if you were being profiled, that kind of thing would would, would come into it. Exactly. But by the same token, somebody who is not um, diagnosed, such as you are could get expelled for exactly the same reason. So it, it doesn't necessarily exactly. point in any one direction. And that's why it's like I there, – there are little things like that that I might pick and choose to leave out, but it's for a reason because they're, they're just – also especially with like drugs and alcohol, there's a lot of judgment, and I just – I don't have time for people's fucking bullshit, honestly. But anyway yeah. – the point is that I ended up in a substance abuse treatment center because mm -hmm. I suffered this rejection that I didn't know how to handle. And, and you know what? I needed a little break. That's how I looked at it. I'm like, I need a break and like to go away. You no, know, it's not like you're getting much sympathy from anybody right now. I know. And I don't want any sympathy. So that's actually great with me because it actually like, like I want to vomit thinking about people like being like, oh, poor thing. <laughs> like honestly, ew. Um, so, <laughs> so I ended up there, and so the, here's where they made a grave mistake at this treatment center mm -hmm. because they diagnosed me and they told me what I was, and I didn't know exactly what I was prior to this. 
Can you just go very briefly into how that came about? Into the context of, of how it came about, I went into a detox for like alcohol and drug detox full of 50 people. And I instantly became the center of everyone's attention. And I'm not saying that in like a like cocky way, like, oh yeah, like everyone was looking at me when I came in the room. No, everyone was looking at me when I came in the room. Like, I'm not exaggerating. No, so, and, uh, so let's, but let's the point take is, that objectively and, and, uh, and take the narcissist side out of it. Just look at it objectively. Do you know um, why? Why do you think it was that that think, that they that they focused on you even even without knowing without why they were me? Yeah. Um, I think it's different for different people, and I think it's it's like I you know I've explained to you. People tell me their life story. I don't give a shit, but they tell me. Um, you know, people gravitate towards me. People are drawn towards me. And it's, it's for different reasons. You know, I know why different men are drawn to me. Um, you know, I, and I, it's, it's like a case by case basis. And so I have to take in people as they approach me basically. And I figure them out very quickly. Um, and I know how to talk to them. I know how to make them more confident. I know how to make them less confident. I know how to make them like me. I know how to make them hate me. You know, I know how to get them to do my bidding for me. You know, all of those things. Is that so, because you've observed it and mimicked it? As Robert Hare says, um, you you don't, don't, didn't know how to do it innately, but you watched it and mimicked it. So that, that means that you're really good at it because you can do it deliberately. Do you, do you think? I think I, I started out with an innate ability, but that innate ability would be relatively useless if I didn't do anything to hone it, if that makes sense. If I just mm -hmm. had an, an innate ability that, like, I don't know, people are just drawn to me and they like to talk to me, and like, I don't know why, and I just never paid attention to it or figured out how to use it to my advantage, then I'd be a very different person. Do you know what I mean? See, that's me. I have mm -hmm. those experiences. People are drawn to me. I didn't even know, want to know why. I don't even want, want to know how. I don't even want it to happen. Right. And see, the, there's, there's a fundamental difference um, where we see different things. Because it doesn't even occur to you to, like, take notes and, and file this for future use. To me, that's all. That's my immediate thought, and that's what I do with basically every interaction. I make notes about people, file it, might need that later. I get a new job, and I walk in, and I find where all of the cameras are. I know the security schedule. I know the maintenance guy's schedule. Yeah, I we've had email exchanges about doing. this yeah, in and regards I know where everyone to AV. Is. Mm -hmm. I always know where everyone is and what they're doing at all times because I need to. I need to know. Because I think you even I made might a comment need... about that on, on one of my YouTube videos. Yes. I think when so. It was either reference... that or an even email. <laughs> yeah. One that referenced um, a AV's behavior at her, at her work and what she was likely to have yes. done. Yep. Yeah, and that's a you know you find out all of the ins and outs of of any new place and new people that you come into contact with. Basically, that's that's just what you do, and it's it's not something I think about or even do consciously. It's just what I do, and it's just what I see. So up until that point. Um, we got off your diagnosis there for a bit, yeah. but up, up until that point, had how much had you ever told anybody else about about this? What, no. Did you internalize it all? Um, I didn't tell it. So here's another interesting thing. I had actually been in therapy for a few years prior to it. I had a therapist um, that I saw weekly. 
but the fun, I played a fun game when I went there and he didn't really know anything real about me. Um, but the fun Why game I would play that? was I would see how long I could get him to talk about himself and his life before he realized it and that he wasn't doing his job. Did your parents send you yes. to the therapy? Yeah. Uh-huh. They didn't really know, like, they just knew there was something, like, not right. <laughs> but they didn't know what was wrong with me. They just were like, there's just something, like, not quite right with you. I don't know. Did you know what was wrong with you? No. But I wasn't, um, I had an open mind about finding out. If there was. I didn't think there was anything wrong with me. But I was perfectly open to someone helping me to understand more about psychology okay so I, I can understand I that. took advantage of that and then yeah. so then when I ended up in this treatment center and basically you know counselors staff that work there you know they noticed that they noticed my behavior um you know women did not particularly like me unless I made an effort for them to um, the men all basically like followed me around drooling, including a couple of the counselors, as I found out later. <laughs> but that's besides the point. Um, the point is just there was one day that and there was also a psychiatrist that visited the facility um, once a week. And this psychiatrist came for two. No, sorry. Um, he came for like four hours and he had to see this was this was a this was like a nice rehab rehab place um he would have to see like 20 or 30 patients in that four hours except every time that I went into his office he ended up spending like an hour or two talking to me and no one else would get to see the psychiatrist and like get their prescriptions and I never understood it. And I don't know. I just sat there talking to the guy. It didn't bother me. And then um, because it was, it took me out of the groups that were annoying. Were you manipulating him? Well, yeah, because he was giving me an excuse to not be doing what everyone else was doing. So I was like, I'll drag this out. That's fine with me. If he'll let me, I'll drag this out. Let's see. And it was like, let's see how long I can get this guy to talk to me and like ignore the 20 other people he's supposed to be seeing today. Let's see if we can do this. Yeah. Yeah. I can and, understand. And I, I would. would do it, but I can understand it. <laughs> and then, um, and then I ended up in my counselor's office one day and, and she told me that I would never be able to maintain any kind of sobriety because my problem wasn't that I was. Oh an addict. my gosh, that's terrible. Well, she said, I, she, she's like, the problem is you're not really an addict. She's like, y you're right. You're not like everyone else, Caitlin. You're, you're, you're right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I know. Thank you. You know, <laughs> that's what I've been telling everyone finally. And then she proceeded and she's like, you would never be able to maintain any kind of sobriety because you're a narcissist and you would never be able to admit that anything had that kind of power over you. And I was like, <sighs> I, I, okay. I, I don't understand that. That seems to me <laughs> illogical. It was, it was very, very strange. So there's a, a little context. There was, there was a, a guy that was involved. Um, this counselor like had a soft spot for this guy, Tim. Um, and Tim liked me quite a bit and you know Tim was fine I liked Tim fine um and one night Tim and I got in trouble we got caught in the act which is forbidden it's not allowed in a rehab you're not allowed to have sex um and so we got caught having sex and the next day you know his parents had to come my parents came and they sat my parents down in a room with me and they proceeded to tell them that I needed to leave this facility, that I was a destructive presence 
in that building and that every moment I was there, I was putting the recovery of all 30 other patients at risk at every moment. And that because of me, that Tim was going to relapse and probably die. Did they, did they tell you that they told you this in front of your parents? So your parents yes. are listening and you are listening to this. Yes. And I'm just like, I was sitting there with an expression on my face like, are they seriously fucking saying this right now? Like, are they really saying this? Like, and are they really trying to put the responsibility for 30 other people staying clean on me? Yeah. Really? Like, what the fuck is wrong with all of you people? And it was it was a surreal thing. I mean, they, it, they See, aren't I, wrong. I, correct me they, if I'm wrong, but... <laughs> Um, and I could well be wrong, but um, to me, if you give a narcissist a challenge, oh. they're likely to take <laughs> you up on that challenge. Never challenge so, me. So Never. if they, someone says to you, you cannot get off this addiction because you are a narcissist, mm -hmm. to me, that's just going to make the narcissist get off that addiction. Right. And maybe that was her point. Maybe that's what she was getting at. I don't know. And, you know, and I did because I was kind of like, well, fuck you, you know, I'll fucking show you, you know, you don't know shit, nah, that, shit about that, me. I, I'm not sure that that therapist actually had that in mind, but mm -mm. that's what came to mind when you said that it was said to you because it, she, it didn't make sense to me. She had a huge smile on her face when she said it, too, which was very strange. But they, you know, they obviously liked this guy more than they liked me. And they tried to get me to leave and send me somewhere else to, um, they tried to send me to a place that was all women. And I was like, oh my God, you guys are ridiculous. There's no way I'm ever going there. That's gross. And then, um, you know, they were like, you can't stay here. And then, um, you know, they were basically having the same conversation. Well, not the same conversation. They were giving Tim sim similar choices in a different room. You know, you can stay here, you can go to the all-male place, or you can leave, you know, you know, because they wouldn't allow us to stay there together. Basically, someone had to go. And mm -hmm. so Tim, Tim, of course, left so that I could stay because, of course, he did because, mm. you know, he was a good boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I stayed and they were all very upset about it and everyone was very upset about it. And I was a destructive. They made me a destructive presence after that. You know? Well, that's right. That's if that's I exactly what happened. That's why it I seemed illo totally illogical to me that they would they would say that to you for so many different reasons. It's, right. it's just the wrong thing to say to a narcissist. So that's the genesis of like my kind of self-awareness because they told me what I was. And then yes, I knew well, that, what that I was would, doing. That would almost validate you. Mm -hmm. It was almost too like sitting in the, that room, like almost like I felt like, I, is she going to say it? Like, is she going to tell me? Is she going to do it? And she did. I think she was excited about it. I don't know why. Maybe she's a sociopath. I don't know. <laughs> it's quite strange. Mm -hmm. But not not knowing her, not knowing her motives, it it I can just chalk it up as 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 being quite bizarre yeah. and unprofessional, perhaps. But I don't know. For me, I mean, I you know I don't look back well, on it as like it this hurtful moment or anything. You know, it was a moment actually that moved me forward. So, yeah, but if her agenda was to to get rid of you and keep Tim, mm -hmm. she went about it completely the wrong way and it backfired on her totally. So exactly. it's quite and strange. If, and if she thought I was a narcissist, uh, you know, would have been, but you know, everything happens for a reason, I guess. Cause here we are. Exactly. So, <laughs> so he is, you were, you were straight NPD. Is it, was that your diagnosis at that stage? At that stage, yeah. I mean, and to be honest, there's there's quite a few diagnoses in my, you know, history because that's just what happens. Cause that's I'm actually quite surprised you weren't initially um, 
erroneously diagnosed as um, borderline? Um, there was a actually there was actually a time when I was erroneously diagnosed as being bipolar, which was a weird one. But I think it was more because like when when I was younger and I would get angry, it was like I would I would lash out and be kind of like psychotic for like five minutes and then it would be over. <laughs> so I think that was, it was kind like of like just, throw feet. Right. I would throw like these massive like tantrums and then I would be like, OK, so what's for dinner? And people found that strange because it is strange, I guess. It's just I like to be like I'm upset and I'm angry and I want to tell you about it and I want to tell you that I fucking hate your guts and you suck and I hope you die. And now that that's out of my system, let's go and have a nice night. Do you want to watch a movie? 